Okuma Media's Policy Yamtabi Madiba, Director of the Ndadaisa Network, Jane Evans, joins me to unpack her memoir titled Epith Unexpected. Welcome, Jane. Thank you, Tabi. I'm really delighted to be joining you today. South Africa's First Lady, Dr. Tebo Mutsebra, has said that while this book is a personal memoir, it is also an important record of early childhood development. So what prompted you to start writing this memoir and did you intend it to be a record for the country's early childhood development? I started writing this memoir to capture the input of the most extraordinary woman working in really tough times from different backgrounds but pretty humble beginnings in the midst of apartheid in the 1980s and actually to capture how something that was incredibly elusive was made a reality. This is maybe the work of these earlier women, earlier pioneers, certainly in the farming districts where I worked, might just disappear into the ether and I think it's important that it's recorded how people defied the odds to make something happen. And as a person whose whole life had been in Johannesburg, you were working as a journalist. What was it like moving to a small town in the Free State after marrying Anthony Evans? And how did you adjust? It was a huge shock in many ways. Um, I found it quite difficult adjusting. And I tried to do all sorts of things to joined into the community to make myself busy. And that led me purely by chance, I would say, to early learning. Um, I'd been on the farm since February 1976. And June 1976, the 16th of June, we have a farm. We had a primary school on the farm for the children of the workers. And my husband was manager of the school. This is the way it worked in those days. And he wanted to go down to the village where the school was situated to see that everything was safe and people were not being traumatized in any way, which they weren't. You know, there were no televisions. There was no social media in those days. You could get stuff through the radio, and that was about all. And while Anthony was talking to the school principal, to see what effects, we actually went down on June the 17th, what effects June the 16th it had, how we could help if necessary. I just saw all these little children running around the farm village where the workers on our farm lived. And I, I said to the headmaster, the principal of the school, isn't there a nursery school for these children to go to? And he looked at me and said, nursery school? He said, there are no nursery schools for farm workers' children. And we drove home again, and my husband, Anthony, said, you're very quiet, what are you thinking about? I said, if the government doesn't provide nursery schools for farm workers' children, for any farm children, for that matter, we're going to do it ourselves. So he looked at me in some surprise and said, what do you know about nursery schools? And I said, I really don't know very much, but I do know people who do. And I did, through my work in the Round Daily Mail, I'd met two extraordinary women. One was a woman called Dawn Haggy, who was then head, I mean, I'm not talking 1970s, of the African Self-Help Association, which was a grouping of women in Soweto and in the Joburg, wealthier northern suburbs, who worked together to make something a reality for children in Soweto. And the other woman was Denise Parkinson, head of the Children's Institution Division with the Joburg City Council. So I went off to see these women and asked them how one would set about such a venture. And armed with a little bit of knowledge, I went home. And Anthony said to me, well, before you get too excited, I think it'd be a good idea if you asked the women, the mothers of these children, if they'd be interested in something like this. So I did. I had, again, another wonderful woman, um, Rebecca Satwani. Rebecca worked in the land. She hoed mealies, basically. But she invited the mothers and women on the farm to meet me. And I explained that a nursery school was not a place of care. I'm sure, it offered care, but it was mainly to begin early learning. Everyone was incredibly dubious. They said, would the kids get something to eat? And I said, of course they would. 
they asked a few more questions. Then somebody said, um, Rebecca was translating because I'm afraid my Sutu was then non existent. Now it's a little bit better, but not sadly enough. One of the women said to me, Who are going to be the teachers? So I said, Well, you are. Whereupon there was absolute chaos, a total uproar. The answers were, we can't read and write, most of us. We know nothing about early learning. We can't be proper teachers. We can't have a nursery school. So Rebecca said to me, why don't you go home and let us discuss this in our own way? I didn't want to go home at all. I was very reluctant. Anyhow, I went home and she came up to my house a bit later and we sat and had tea and a chat. And she said, look, if there's food to eat, they're interested in the nursery school. So I thought, well, that's, that's great. It's one way of starting our venture. But then Rebecca said, but first we have to ask the men. Why did we have to ask the men? Because that's the way things were done. My husband had a, what he called a liaison committee, which was fairly unheard of in those days. Um, these were a group of the men who worked on the farm so they, they could have a proper communication. And how the men debated this, they said they really couldn't see why there should be another school on the farm. It already was a primary school. In any case, kids didn't learn until they were a bit older. But in the long, the end of the story was if there was going to be food and if the kids would be cared for for half the day, let's go. So we started with this nursery school and it went from there. We got back to the question of who was going to teach the teachers. Who was going to choose the teachers? Rebecca Satwani put together a committee of women in the farm village, with the workers called it the Stadt. I was told in no uncertain terms that I should go to Johannesburg or wherever I wanted to go to find out what one did in such a school. And Rebecca and her committee would find women who wanted to be trained to be, I suppose, what were then those days paraprofessional teachers. And I was summoned to a meeting one day, and Rebecca said to me very proudly, these women we have chosen, one was called Mrs. Satwani, and she was going to be one of the teachers, and Maria Takiso was going to be a teacher, Bertha Serapello. Bertha had been employed to help cook in my house. I was a very new bride. I was very unused to running a household. I looked at Bertha in horror and said, but you work here and you cook. She said, I don't like cooking. Well, I thoroughly sympathized because nor did I. And Maria Takiso was living in the stud. She wasn't busy. So these women became our teachers. It was absolute chaos. I found it very difficult. I was not a teacher. It's one thing knowing stuff and reading about it. It's a totally different skill imparting knowledge to other people in a way that they actually enjoy it and absorb it and can be part of it. So it was back to African self-help and Denise Parkinson who helped our woman get on board. So now can you talk to us more about the birth of the Ntataisa Network, the NGO, which is yes. now more than 40 years? Around about the mid-1980s, I became aware of an organization called the Rural Foundation or the Landlucker Stichting, which had been started by farmers in the Western Cape. The Landlucker Stichting's politics and mine didn't necessarily coincide, but they were doing some very good work with health in various farm communities. So I went down to see the head of this organization, a very nice man called Oki Bosman. And I said, if there are requests or if there are any ideas of starting nursery schools, please don't. We're already doing it. Maybe we can work together. And suddenly, we got requests from all over the place, specifically in the early days in what is now Limpopo and Mpumalanga and in the Free State, to help a number of farm communities start nursery schools. We were going to need more staff for this. We were going to need a proper project. So I went off to something called the Bernard van Leer Foundation. I, in fact, went to ask them for funding for a nursery school, which was starting in Ramalotsi Township near to us. And they said, 
it's a very worthy course, but we only fund innovative pilot projects in the field of early childhood development. Why don't you give us something to do with farms? There is nothing in this country for farm workers, children. So I sent in a proposal, they accepted it. We set up an independent board of trustees and set about employing two supervisors come trainers to go and work on farms in other parts of the country. Initially, we worked in about three districts and after about three or four years, we were working in eight districts and it was becoming totally impossible for Maria Mofrachledi and Lydia Carbani and Bonnie and Soleng, who were our very early trainers, to get to all those areas to help teach women on the farms to become paraprofessional preschool teachers. They were in those early days. Anyhow, we battled on and then USAID, which gave us a lot of money, came to see us. And this is where I met the marvelous man called Jonathan Janssen, who I'm still friends with today. And they said, is there anything else we can fund? And I said, yes, we're working in a number of areas in the Free State, Limpopo and Mpumalanga. These organizations want to become independent. They want their own boards of trustees. They want to run themselves whilst retaining in Tataisa to do the training. So this funding was forthcoming. And after a three-year period, there were eight independent early childhood development training resource organizations, which were the core of the Ntatiisa network. And over the years, even though we haven't been able to assist with funding, this has grown until today we've got 22 organizations in seven provinces who are affiliated to us and with whom we work very closely. We support each other, we develop the training materials in line with what is required by the CETA and the Qualifications Authority. And it's a very good support system for people who often work in isolation and there's someone to talk to. And we keep up to date with what's happening in the ECD field, in the broader field, and then we can share it with our network. It's a wonderful grouping of organizations working in very different communities. And can you tell us more about how the role of NGOs and solid vocational training and support for women in isolated, disadvantaged communities will remain vital to the continuing spread of good quality early childhood development in the country? Okay, this is what this is what I think. I mean, the government, which pre-1994 really wasn't about to help, certainly us, Post-1994, government has embraced early childhood development. They've got very good policies. I think the proof of the pudding coming up will be in how these new policies under the Department of Basic Education are implemented. But I have no doubt in my mind that the role of the non-government organization is still vital. It's one thing, this is through experience. You can train people, you can do it in a lecture way, you can do it online, but you need, we have found that people need face-to-face, on-site support to implement what they've learned. And I mean, we're talking now about women who have, them, well, today some of them might have gone to preschools, but we're not talking about um, very well-resourced preschools with parents with very comfortably off. We're talking about areas where people are determined to make preschool a possibility, but it's not financially that easy. The role of the NGO, I feel, will be to do the on-site visits to make sure that there's a good quality learning which takes place in the ECD centres or the playgroups. All children need the same opportunity and the same quality. And I think that um, the NGOs are the right people to keep doing this, working in conjunction with the Department of Basic Education. And lastly, what are you hoping people take away after reading your book? I hope that people will take away an understanding of how people during the apartheid era got to do things for themselves drawing on expert help, 
and making sure that they weren't totally left behind. It's, um, I don't like the word owed, but it's, it's really to capture what an incredible woman decided to band together to do when no one else was going to do it. And really, where there's a determination and will, there is very often a way of succeeding. That was Jane Evans speaking to Krima Media's Polity about a path unexpected.